One of the most important functions of a live sports broadcast is making sure that everything is technically in place, no matter the size of the event. From catering to parking permits and location scouting, operations can make or break a production. My guest on this episode has worked some of the biggest events in the world, including eight Olympic Games, 12 World Championships, two World Cup Soccers, a combined 32 Tennis Open Championships around the globe, Major League Baseball, and many studio events. Terry Brady joins me on the Sports in the Making podcast to talk about what goes into production operations, and he shares some stories he's been a part of in his amazing career. This episode has visuals, so if you're listening, please be sure to subscribe to the Sports in the Making YouTube channel at Sports Making to see some of what we discuss. My guest today is someone who I consider a great friend, a person I have a ton of respect for, and although we see each other much less than when I was working at ESPN, I still keep up with what he's doing occasionally and what he did in his sports career, including recently retiring. Congratulations, Terry. How's re- okay. retirement <laughs> retreating you the last few weeks or uh, months? It's, uh, it's new to me, that's for sure, uh, and I'm enjoying it, actually. It's uh, <laughs> definitely a lifestyle change, for sure. Well, and as, it, as I just found out, you're not really retired. You just don't have a regular type of thing, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, so on this episode, we're going to be talking about your, your career working in operations with ESPN's Remote Productions, which, which I consider one of those careers that not many outside of TV know or even understand, um, which I think can be highly rewarding, and it gets very little, rec- very little recognition for a job well done. So... Uh, first, I want to revisit how we know each other, and feel free to give me a different account as my memory is fading. Um, when we met, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> you returned to ESPN um, after working somewhere else, uh, and you were working on international productions. Uh, we worked on Dominican baseball. How do you remember it all? Uh, it was uh, it was a great time, um, especially working in countries that. Um, you know, I've had the pleasure of working in, you know, large events in, in other countries, but, uh, you know, some of the challenges around um, baseball and things like that in the Dominican Republic are, are, are a lot of fun to try to solve. Um, the good part about that is that um, people down there are great. They might not have all the resources that you need, but everyone's pulling the, pulling the uh, oars in the same direction, and it, it always seems to work out. And it's a it's very rewarding in the fact that you can, you know, you, you have what you have and you make the best of what you have. And it always turns out great for some reason. It, well, it's it, it, some of the great memories for me because we, we kind of bonded when we traveled uh, initially. And here's I'm just going to show you real quick, get some pictures in here of, <laughs> of some of us working in the Dominican. This is at the uh, San Juan Airport taking all of our stuff and then... Uh, you know, Tom McShane, who's now VP at CBS Sports and Operations. Tom's yeah. a, a great guy. And then us, when we got to Estadio Quisqueya in Santo Domingo, uh, I think we were all kind of surprised that those bottles uh, back there are bottles of rum that they sell to fans. What was your perception on that? That was entirely true. Uh, we were completely blown away, selling small bottles of rum, and you, the you'd get a Coca-Cola along with it, and uh, you take your Coca-Cola and your bottle of rum to your seat and you'd mix your own drinks. And when your ice ran out, some young lady or some young man would walk down the aisle and you'd scoop into a bucket and put more ice in your cup and away you'd go. And uh, those were great experiences. I love the fans in the Dominican Republic. They constantly sing. They bang drums. Uh, it is a complete party atmosphere and it's a well-natured atmosphere. They, everyone appreciates baseball there, both teams. Uh, there didn't seem to be any animosity toward any of the other uh, fans or if you rooted for the other team. Uh, it was just a magical experience down there. It was fabulous. Oh, look, and that's, uh, that's a Hall of Famer right there. Yeah, Juan Marichal for the San Francisco Giants, along with Kevin Cabral, who's the play-by-play announcer for uh, ESPN for a bit. Um, what did you think of the stadium there? Uh, the stadium was like a you know a, a minor league stadium in the uh, in the United States, um, and baseball is the same dimensions. They play in the same field. I do want to go back to Juan Marichal though. Um, I it, <laughs> I'm a big time Mets fan, and uh, Juan Marichal used to dominate the Mets, you know beyond belief when I was when I was growing up and go, a little kid going to the games. And I asked him about it, and he he said. Uh, I think he only let up like one run or some ludicrous amount of limited runs. 
and he remembered one that one of his second basemen the air, the in Chase Stadium the 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 wind blew the ball back and he was com- still complaining for 30 40 years <laughs> later that the second baseman should have caught the ball and he would have had a, a one hitter or something like that <laughs> but i'm like really you remember that and uh, sure enough i'm sure he did he was uh, he was a really great guy i really yeah. enjoyed one Michelle. a lot it was of an fun. honor meeting him that's for sure it it sure was and it was an honor working with him there were so many perspectives that i got from him just on how he, you know, was in the dugout in San Francisco, uh, working on a no hitter, and he was in the dugout, and the coach, uh, the manager, was going to pull him out, and he ran out to the mound when the inning half inning finished, so that he can continue pitching. So <laughs> there, there's so many great stories from him. And then you're front and center here, keeping everything with operations going, um, and that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about today as well. Is is getting into what it is uh, that an operations producer is. Can you explain what that role is and how it works within the whole production aspect of TV well, sports? Yeah, I, it's always very hard to explain to someone. Uh, when I used to tell my mother what I used to do, she you know, would say I was the producer of the uh, U.S. Open Golf. I'm like, not quite, Mom, but uh, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks for the promotion. Um, but... Um, I, I, I see it akin to like you would organ like an, somebody organizing a, an orchestra, right? So you're going to need to a you know get you know assemble number one the right people to be able to do the job, and then give them the right equipment, the right tools. You know, in an orchestra's case, the the you know the instruments, the violins, and the you know whatever else you would need, and then you would need a leader to that who would a technical leader that would would pull it all together, which would be like the conductor, and you you kind of assemble all the pieces necessary for remote operation, and that would include everything from fiber optic transmission to uh, ordering the Porter Johns. It seems a little bit crazy, um, but that's pretty much what, you know, the operations basically do whatever you have to do to get the show on the air and, um, and manage the team when you're actually on site. Uh, and that's a big part of it, too, um, having everybody... Uh, being able to communicate uh, what we're trying to do to everybody, letting the people who have the expertise do what they need to do. Uh, don't micromanage anything, but you know, keep the keep the ship going in the the right direction. Uh, and you know, and if something fails, have a backup plan, or you know, at least wing it to the best of your abilities to be able to fix it. Uh, and you know, that happens. You know, not a, as much as people think it does, but it does happen. So. Most of the I like, time, it's smooth sailing. Yeah, I like to think that um, the ops producers are the ones that save a show, not only before it even starts, but when things go wrong. How would you describe the challenges that come along with that position? Well, I think the first thing is you you minimize um, all those challenges by preparation going into it, and that goes down to the, the smallest details. If you can have the smallest, de- you know, uh, pick out the smallest details, make sure they're covered, then you have a tendency to stay away from larger problems, right? Um, there's, you know, innately there's backup systems and plans in place uh, if something goes awry, but obviously not for everything. Uh, and then you have to be able to uh, utilize your resources. So in working for a company like ESPN, they have such vast resources and experts in every field um, that you would be able, as long as you knew how to contact somebody in an emergency, they could probably help you solve that problem. Uh, so it, it comes all with experience, but it also comes with hard work and, and knowledge and passion for what you're trying to do. Um, and I would disagree that, you know, we don't, you know, operations folks um, would like to think they're the, 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 the best in the show, but it is, is an entirely a team effort, you know, if you look back. And people don't know that about uh broadcast sports television it's there's everybody from you know from the production groups to the finance to the 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 technical folks to the transmission folks to uh the crewing people you know it, it there's many many the graphics folks who build all this stuff it, it's there's many many people involved in remote uh not just the people on site uh and that, and that's a lot of people don't know that. there's a lot of great careers in in behind the scenes uh in sports broadcasting or even entertainment broadcasting or television or or, or film uh, speaking of that, uh, how did you get into this business? Was, were, were you attracted towards the operations side, or was, was it by accident, like I've heard a lot of people say? How did you get in there? Uh, well, it was uh, a little bit of uh, good fortune and by accident. Uh, I went to school and uh, majored. I came out with a 
double degree in biology and chemistry, which really sets you up well for a television career. Um, and then I coached lacrosse for a little bit, and uh, I used to work to supplement my um, my income uh, bartending and and doing things. And I was a bar manager down in Florida, and these two guys would come in. This is a true story. would come in every day at 3 o'clock, and I'm going, what do you guys do? Do you can get off at 3 o'clock and have a beer? And then they said, we're television cameramen. And I'm like, well, that sounds good. How do I do that? So they sent me to... Uh, uh, I to get a fir- they told me I needed a first class FCC license, which at the time and this is way back when, you really didn't need it, but they told me I needed it. So I went and got one of those, um, and then I got um, through a friend, as almost everything has, a job at Satellite News Channel in Stanford, Connecticut. I uh, worked there for about a year as a news associate um, and doing videotape playback and working in the graphics department. You do a little bit of everything, and it was all shifted. Uh, and then we were informed over the the wire at the time when you know you have UPI and Reuters that we were all fired because Turner bought us all out and we were going to close down in a month and um, so when we were closing down uh, I have time I guess um, I used to work with a guy a format producer we used to be satellite news used to be satellite news, news channel used to be 24 hour news uh, and we'd have five minutes for each of the affiliates around the country so part of my job was to log videotape, and if anything had national importance, I was to take it to a format producer who would turn it into a VOSOT or a VO or, what, or a package, depending on the importance. And then um, the editors would cut it up. And well, when everyone was leaving, all the editors left, and I went to deliver um, a piece, and uh, no one was around, so I cut it myself. And I, it was like, I think it was like 29 seconds. This is a VO video on top of a read. And uh, I cut it, I was so paranoid, I cut it frame to frame, 20, 29 seconds, and no more. And of course it aired, and as soon as he got through the 29 seconds, the screen went to black, thanks to me, because I had nothing behind uh-huh. it. No pad. Uh, and uh, I got in trouble, and someone said, who, who, who uh, edited that? And um, they said, I said, I did. And they said, congratulations, you're editor for the next two weeks. Uh, did that. Uh, we got bought out by uh, Turner. I moved to Colorado and I got a job at a small television uh, c- a company called uh, KSPN TV, um, and that was Aspen and Vail. And uh, we used to do a lot of fun things. We do a lot of the Vail Resorts um, teaching pieces. We do VNRs for the front range um, s- stations. Um, we would shoot a lot of ENG for an AV for just about anybody and everything. But they also had um, we also did uh, a news show every day. Um, so I became a reporter, and you know, you shot your own stories, you edited your own stories, you writ- wrote your own story, write your own stories, then you put them on air. So uh, I've had a lot of uh, a fun, fun time there. And then in 1989, the World Alpine Ski Championship came to Vail, and um, ABC was the host broadcaster for that. It was the first time in 40 years, and um, I could ski, and uh, I learned how to do cable. And I helped cable the entire mountain and all the compounds. And uh, ABC got, you know, that became the guy because I knew where everything was. And so ABC and ESPN were there. And I met, uh, you know, Jeff Mason and Jed Drake and uh, Don Colantonio and a bunch of folks. And, uh, of course, I was enamored with ESPN, so I I followed them around and gave them everything I possibly could. And uh, luckily, Don uh, Colantonio gave me a chance to become a camera operator uh, for another ski event that happened after, and uh, I took off from there. And I always liked the operation side, so I'd stick around uh, as a cameraman after the show was over and talk to the engineers and ask them if they needed any help. And they they always had something they could do, either you know fix a triax or you know do something. And uh, so kind of got into that, and um, I um, just kept going and uh, kept bugging ESPN and. They started hiring me as an operations producer, and my first event was in 1994 as an operations producer at World Cup Soccer as a freelance World Cup. I had no idea what I was doing. And this is, we're starting small, the World Cup. Uh, ESPN was yeah. uh, right. So, so, yeah, so what happened was, I mean, they, you know, like uh, the engineer would ask me, you want to go Telos or Four Wire? And I'd be like, uh, I have no idea what you're talking about, but uh, let's try Telos, you know. <laughs> So I fudged my way through the first few years, but you get, you know, like I said before, your experience always wins out, and, you, and you, if you're passionate and really enjoy what you do, it, it always works out. I do have a fun story, though, uh, about my reporting days. We were, um, and Don, you can appreciate this being a Colorado person. 
uh, in Vail in the old days, they used to herd sheep from the lower pastures up to actual Vail Mountain where the sheep would graze over the summer and that would keep the grass down for like, you know, for the snow making later on in the year. So they had like 3,000 head or 2,000 head of uh, sheep come down. So I thought this would be great. Um, we'll get a story out of this. So I do, I'm interviewing the guys on the horses and I, my, my clothes is standing in the back of the street as the sheep is coming toward me and my tagline was reporting for KSPN TV, knee deep in sheep. This is Terry Brady. <laughs> well, what happened was we strung a, an XLR mic cable across all the way because we had, you know, 100 feet of mic cable because we didn't have any wireless mics. And the sheep came around me, and they're big, and they smell, and they caught my uh, microphone cable and pulled me down into the sheep. So I was on my hands and knees with sheep walking all over me and around me, <laughs> panicked. I still had hair, so I pop out of the, I pop out of the sheep with my hair all straight up like this. And uh, I, with this panic look on my face, of course, so we cut the whole thing together. We, we left, we sent it in, and um, the announcers were laughing so hard. It actually made uh, uh, KCNC News about you know, some sort of idiot reporter. <laughs> well, we used to do some fun <laughs> stuff like that. That was a great job because we could do anything we wanted, and uh, we took a lot of liberty, so it was good stuff. Anyway, I, that's how I, I got there, kind of. I wish I had talked to you about this before, and I would have looked for the footage. To <laughs> somehow, oh, I'm sure it's long gone. I mean, that was that was 1987 or 88. That was a long time ago. That stuff is all. That tape is deteriorated. Thankfully, thankfully it's gone. Dust. <laughs> so, so you talked about getting in and and not really understanding what you were doing, even though you had an ops producer freelance job. What was the thing that you discovered most, and why did you end up staying in that as a career as opposed to some of the other things you mentioned? Uh, well, a lot of reasons. One, um, it was exciting. You got uh, the, the the most. Ex there's two things I, I took out of that that I really loved. One was the fact that you were literally building something from scratch, and at the very end of it, you took it all apart. So you know when we we were doing things like the U.S. Open, I remember sitting under a a tree watching you know, the office trailers pull in. This is the U.S. Open Golf at Bethpage. And um, I was placing them and all that stuff. And then we go through this crazy, fun event. And at the very end, I remember sitting under the same tree watching the last of that office trailer get pulled away. And I'm like, wow, we just built this little city. We built this little project. And now there's, it's gone again. And I love the, the fact that it was never the same. And all the challenges, although similar, if you're doing whatever sport, always there's challenges. But the best part about the job is you get to go in early and you get to meet all the people in and around uh, the wherever remote you're working with. So if you're going in to do a football game at you know uh, Ohio State or wherever that might be, you get to meet all the stadium managers. You get to meet the sport organizers, the ads. You meet the people that you know have the passion for that sport and their job, and you work with them. And it's all about people relationship, and uh, you know there's so many great stories that you have, and so many great people that I've met over the course of my career that just way too many to ever count or ever see again. But you you have that, you know everyone's pulling in the same direction to make uh, the best production that you possibly can, and it's really rewarding when it, you pull it off. And you start with nothing, and then you end with nothing, and you're on to the next thing. The other thing I really liked is you're on to the next thing. There's really, you're not going back to do the same thing over and over and over. Uh, and that, that's, very few people get to do that in their jobs. And I, I absolutely love that part about it. People first, though. That was the best. Yeah, and people, building relationships is something that I kind of pulled out of that. When an event comes together, let's say a network gets the rights to this event, what is the process from where you stand in operations? Well, I mean, it starts with the schedule. With the pro As I mentioned before, there's all these different jobs. It starts with the programming group to say, hey, I want to do this event, this game. And then it, part of it is, well, how, much, how many resources are we going to put toward this event in the coverage of that? Uh, and then the production groups gets involved in that, depending on how much and what they think the validity of the of the uh, I wouldn't say validity what you know what is 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 the benchmark for covering it the proper way um, and then the all the things that would be added on top of that to make that broadcast special um, and then we would get the blueprint for that and then again we work with the people who book the the mobile units or the people who book the fly packs um, we work with the crewing department to say we need X amount of these people 
all of that is tied together with a budget. So you you know if you have a certain amount that you have allocated, which are, you know people in program finance would help you do that. If you have allocated, you had to manage and navigate that. In certain instances, it became more difficult than others, and you'd have to move things around to to try to make that work. Okay, and then you would go and you plot it out, and you you make sure you know the schedule of how you want to do this. Uh, that um, you know when when how early do you have to bring someone in? What's the latest you can bring someone in? When you need to park in power? Um, then you have to go to reach out to the schools or to the to the event uh, to the to the sport organizer and say, you know, hey, we're coming. We need this much space. We need this much power. We need you know blah blah blah. How do we do this? Um, and you work with them, and then you get with the current people and you have to get you know manage the credentials. Uh, and you have to work if you're if you're doing a dual role as an operations producer and a technical manager, you have to work with integration of any equipment that you need to bring in that would integrate in with the existing equipment of a mobile unit or or a uh, or a fly pack or whatever. However you're using it now nowadays, it's you know everything from TVU to you know a home internet that, like we're doing right now on a, on a show. However, um, and then you then you organize it all and you go out on site and then you manage it from site. You go and you meet the people that you're talking to on the phone. You walk through the do's and don'ts uh, of what the, the venue would offer. Uh, and a lot of times you feel there's a lot of issues out there or, or things you need to solve on, on site. You get those taken care of. The crew shows up. You manage the crew. Um, and you work with the production group on what they want to accomplish. And you're very close hand-in-hand hand with, with those folks. Uh, and then when it's all done, you... You inventory it and pack it all up again, and you you know, load the trucks and let them go to the next spot. The next spot, uh, and then you do a post report, and you're on to your next event. So that's what I was mentioning before that, it, you know, it's it's a, it's everything's kind of the same. You know, football is football, baseball is baseball, um, but every stadium's different, every uh, situation's different. So the nuances change from from week to week, and that's a great challenge, and it, it keeps you keeps you on your toes. It's great fun. You mentioned technology and how it's changed from the time that you've been in. I know there's tons of technology changes, but what do you think has been the most significant change in your years of, of covering sports? Uh, IP, tra- uh, IP um, uh, bandwidth, uh, how we do how we do things now, sending things um, over, uh, you know, uh, over internet, if you will, and 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 uh, whether it's you know fiber driven or whatever. Um, that's I think that's one of the biggest innovations. It'll, you know, the the use of bandwidth now. If you're looking at all the productions, they're all uh, live from home productions or Remy's, uh, things along those lines. They're using, um, you know, they're using IP based uh, transmission. Um, that and you know, uh, obviously the the you know the the so steady advance of HD to uh, 3G to 4K, you know, ultra um, ultra high definition. All those things are, are, are advancements that uh, are so, so different from when we first started and using one inch videotape and beta cam and uh, analog. Uh, I mean, that's it. So um, anyway, so, you know, everything's different. Um, but I think that I would think that, the, you know, the IP based uh, broadcasting is probably the biggest thing at the moment moving forward. Allows people to do anything from any place, anywhere. Allows people to manipulate equipment in a truck that's 3,000 miles away. Um, it's, 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 all, it's mind-boggling, to be honest with you. <laughs> a lot of smart people out there, and I'm not one of them, but uh, <laughs> there's, uh, the, it's crazy. And when we talk about the technology, obviously the, the budgets have grown to be bigger as well. Is there, what, what's the challenge when you're talking about different budgets for different events? Is it, is it restrictive sometimes or, or you just have all of the bells and whistles that you could possibly imagine to get this done? How, do, how, does, that, how does each event dictate the budget? It's like anything else. Uh, I mean, if you want to go buy a steak and you have a dollar fifty in your pocket, and you, you're not going to Ruth Chris to buy a steak, uh, but if you go, you know, to the to the local sandwich shop, you can get a steak sandwich for a buck fifty. Well, you can't, but you know what I'm getting at. So what what is the challenge is? It, and I, I hate I hate calling it a challenge. It's more like uh, you have what you have, and you make the best of it. Um, I alluded to that when we were talking about the Dominican baseball. You have the equipment, you have the resources that you have been allocated, and your challenge and your 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 
job is to get as much as you possibly can out of that, out of that, or out of those, out of those resources. And because you have limited resources, does not mean that you can't do a quality broadcast, and does not mean that you can't get, you know, whatever you want to the to the person consuming that that content. Um, you know, you look at high schools now that are shooting uh, high school football games and soccer games and volleyball games, and you have you have people on the other end, family and friends and everyone else watching that, and they're overjoyed to see their son or daughter. You know, in a soccer match uh, from a rival high school. Um, I mean, so there's people consuming content, and and if it's on anything, if you think back when everything had to be broadcast quality, and then you look at some of the news, and now all the news is sending, you know, uh, uh, or putting on the air cell phone footage or whatever they could, even though it was bad. And the thing is that it was the message and the content that that is king, and it drives it. So going back to what you're saying before, as far as you know, managing budgets or having any, uh, you don't know, you don't get all the bells and whistles, but you get what you get and you manage it accordingly. And that's, that's kind of the fun and challenge of uh, being in operations. We talked also earlier about international productions. You've been to a few different countries. I don't know if you could list them all as in this next answer, but what, what are some of the things that you've done internationally and how does that compare to uh, say a, 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 a U.S. event? Um, well, I'll start with telling you that I've had the privilege and honor of going to uh, and being involved, whether visiting or not, or working in uh, 31 countries, which not a lot of people have had that opportunity. Um, and that goes everywhere from El Salvador and Trinidad and Tobago to Australia to, to Norway and to, uh, you know, to uh, Sweden, um, I've had I've had the pleasure of doing multiple Olympic Games uh, when I was freelancing um, with NBC. Um, you know, in Torino, in um, Salt Lake City, in uh, just came back from Beijing. I was I had the opportunity to do that, which is fantastic. Uh, I work for the Olympic uh, broadcaster in Atlanta, so I've done a bunch of Olympics, which are really exciting. I've also done a bunch of World Championships that are really exciting. I've done some World Cup soccer's. On different countries, and uh, they're working in other countries is not as daunting as uh, as you might imagine. Um, it's the people there are always qualified. Uh, do they do things sometimes a little bit differently? Of course they do, but for the most part, everything's pretty consistent in putting on a, a sports broadcast. Um, that goes for everything from camera positions and other things from country to country. Um, but you'd find that. There are all, always resources in, in different countries, and the people are just as, as qualified and just as proud and just as good as anybody in the United States, albeit they do things a little bit differently. So if you can kind of balance that uh, and, and find that right balance to be able to get the most out of the, the local resources there, um, and they vary. I mean, going to Australia and going to El Salvador are two different, different you know, Different, different games, if you will. We were talking a little bit before about what you have, which is what you have. Um, you uh, find that, you know, you have a lot of qualified and talented people in all these places. And, and one thing I really, it's really shows someone is we're all alike, whether we're, you know, whether we live in Australia, whether we live in, in Trinidad and Tobago, or whether we live in South Africa, or wherever you want to pick a country, people are people. And, uh, they all react to the same things, and they all want to do a good job. They're all passionate about uh, their craft, and uh, it makes it a lot easier. I mean, you saw that in the Dominican Republic. What a great group of guys we had pulling, pulling all those games off. It's fabulous. You've worked on some major, major events. What are those like for you, and what's the most favorite that you've worked on? Ooh. Well, I have to say that one I'm uh, probably the most proud of is is the United States Tennis Open. Um, we we went from a truck-based solution to uh, a fly pack solution, uh, 100%, um, uh, 100% fiber driven from a, a copper to a fiber infrastructure. Uh, we ended up having to do seven at the time seven linear courts and some other automated courts. Um, putting that together with you know thousands and thousands of, you know, 3,000 plus fibers, uh, thousands of feet of copper, um, you know, internal to uh, a fly pack situation, 
manning, you know, 130 plus cameras at the time. And it's up to higher now, but at Rano it's like 131 cameras. Uh, the the massive crewing effort it took to 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 you know do those positions both day and night session. Um, the you know the people to manage the just changing the the course of how to how to cover an event that had been covered in a certain way for so many years uh, was a, uh, I think one of the, my most proudest things. Um, but yet it was also one of the <laughs> I lost the most sleep over I think because uh, it just kept it kept you know it was this massive massive thing that you had to do and put together in a year's time and a little over a year's time and. Um, in the back of your mind say, yeah, this, theoretically, this is all going to work, but until you actually see it actually happen and come together, uh, there's a little trepidation in that. But um, I'm, very, I'm very proud of that in, um, in so many ways. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that helped um, was my background in other large you know, events, um, being at World Cup skiing or uh, world championships, like I alluded to in 1989 and again in 1999, um, you have this big, massive event, and um, it, it sometimes it seems like it's just too much. It's it's you know it, I always say t- you're just taking a bite out of the elephant, and everyone who gets into it, especially if you're young or you're just starting, it seems like it's so overwhelming and you're never going to get to the finish line. But you just got to keep going. You just got to take a little bit at a time, and every little victory ends up and you end up you know surprisingly at the finish line when you, when they're ready to drop the puck or where they kick the ball off or throw the first pitch you are you are ready to go um and sometimes it just doesn't seem when during the process that you're doing it but that's what makes that process really kind of special so uh, i would say u.s opens have been highlights world alpine ski championships uh, have been a highlight of my career um do the seaport studios uh, I was new to building out the su- Seaport Studios in New York. ESPN gave me the opportunity to do that. That was totally new to me. I never was in a studio environment before. Uh, it was a big learning experience. Um, that was that that I'm very proud of. That's a a great location. That's that's it in the beginning um, uh, on a pier in the, in the middle of uh, <laughs> uh, the East River, basically. Um, that and you know all the Olympics I've done and all the large events, the World Championships. I absolutely love those. I think they're the, the most they're the f- most fun to work on. Um, again, you know, going back to what I said before, it's you meet the people, you're working with people for a long period of time, and you know when you if you stop and think about what you're doing, and you go, oh my God, um, you know, 300 million people are. <laughs> going to be seeing this event, you know, or World Cup, you know, you're in World Cup, you go, well, everyone in the United States right now is going to watch this thing, there's going to be millions of viewers, and you're the guy, with, you know, holding the end of the cable, like, you know, so I plug this in, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or don't touch anything, you know, right. uh, so those, those are the things that I, I find the most rewarding and, and fun about uh, broadcast business. I had a, I've had a blessed career, that's for sure. Yeah, you mentioned earlier as well that, uh, you would sit under a tree, watch everything come in, and you'd be under that tree watching everything leave. The people behind the scenes, again, I don't feel get enough recognition. What do you do when when everything is up and running? Do you have a chance to watch the game, or are you constantly seeking out, making sure everybody is is comfortable and getting what they what they need? Well. Um... A little bit of everything to answer that. You kind of, if you're interested in the team you're playing, if my Mets are playing, or I'll, I'll poke my head in and see them. But if you know some of the other teams playing, probably not. Um, what you start doing is, yeah, you want to make sure everything was taken care of. But when the game is on, you're starting to think about how you're going to strike and get the heck out of there. Um, and that's true for all events, whether it's a whether it's a Wimbledon or whether that's a baseball game. Um, you know, you, you start working on that as you go th- as you go through it. You want to just, you know, you're there um, and hopefully nothing ever happens and you're a little bit bored. But the operations folks are all pre and post for the most part. Um, and during the game, you know, while you do have a chance to sometimes enjoy what's going on in the field, um, your mind's not really on it like a true fan sitting watching a game. Um, you're thinking about how you're going to get a strike and, you know, you just want to monitor, make sure everyone's okay and make sure the transmission's okay and, you know, and you know, being ready if something with a solution if something happens to go wrong. So that's kind of what you do. Um, but you know, it's it's certainly a lot of fun, and it's certainly being part of um, you know a broadcast and 
You know, how many people get to walk on a baseball diamond in the major leagues? How many people get to walk on a track at the Olympic Games? I mean, it, it, you know, I keep gushing a little bit about what I've, you know, now that we're talking about it, I'm thinking back on, wow, you know, I'm, I'm real spoiled. So uh, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's just a, it's a great, it's a great lifestyle. It's a, a busy lifestyle and a huge commitment. Uh, and if you have the passion and you like people, uh, you can do it. And, and you just mentioned, you know, getting getting to walk on the on the field, and and y- you get to meet athletes too. I know it's not it's hard to develop a relationship when you're talking to them, but uh, and I'm sure this is just one of the few pictures that yeah. you probably have. <laughs> Explain a little bit about some of these photos here. Uh, that's yeah. just me at a World Cup soccer. Sam Darnold, I think, is the only photograph I have with anybody because uh, we're not supposed to take photos with with people, and and the, the athletes, um, you know, they. You know, you do get, you do have, uh, you do meet them, but you don't really get a chance to know them, really. Um, and you, you don't want to bug them. Hey, can you, you know, hey, such and such, can you take a picture with me, you know? Um, it's it's kind of funny. It, um, I remember we were doing, uh, for, at Bethpage, we were doing uh, an ANG interview after the, after the, uh, after Tiger Woods won the, the U.S. Open. And I remember standing there and we had the ENG team and the lighting guys and our talent in there. And Tiger Woods walks in and goes, "Hi, I'm Tiger," and he shakes everybody's hands like, like I'm like he doesn't know my name. What the heck, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, you, I don't have a whole lot of pictures with me and any of the any of the athletes. Although you do get you do get to meet a lot of the talent who are former athletes, and, and right. you do engage with them, and and the stories they have are fantastic, and uh, you love hearing their insight. You know, if you do football, you're like, "Hey, how how are the Jets going to do this week?" And, and the answer is always the same: terrible. But um, right. you know, it's kind of get to get the inside info. Yeah, well, one of the pictures you also sent me uh, was curious to me because a couple of episodes ago I interviewed the original Philly fanatic. Um, how did he treat you when you were uh, in in this picture? <laughs> <laughs> well, he was rubbing my head. I think for good luck. Um, and then he, I was following him down the hallway, and I was taking a video of him. And he turned around and he, you know, stuck the tongue out and hit me right in the camera. And, so it was great fun working with a fanatic. Uh, it was even more fun to find out who that person really is, um, and you know what his life is really all about, and what he's done or she's done. I can't divulge he, which gender. Yeah. Um, um, what the, what they have done in their life, and just you know, hey, what is it like to be the Philly fanatic? I mean, come on, you get to abuse people all day, and everyone loves you. So uh, yeah. it was a lot of fun with the fanatic. We had him in uh, uh, K Rod uh, thing at the at the um, seaport. Uh, Alex Rodriguez and Michael K show. So he was on with them one one night. It was a lot of fun. Well, if you want to take a listen to uh, maybe what goes on in there, take a listen to that episode. <laughs> I, I'm going to have to absolutely look that one up for sure. <laughs> All right, Terry. As we wind down, a couple more questions for you sure. here. Um, you've won five Emmys. Um, you told me before the show two for X Games, a couple of technical awards. Uh, the World Cup, the Manning Show, which was your most recent. What goes into the technical side of winning an Emmy? Well, winning an Emmy is, especially in the sports Emmy world, is a total team effort. It's never, it's not like an, an Emmy for acting or whatever, although they have their support crews and their thing. It's, it's a collective effort. Um, and again, you know, going back to how we started this conversation, it, this is all about a team, and it's all about everyone going and and moving in the same direction to produce quality talent uh, ta- um, content. And um, it's you know, yeah, I hate to say it, I just been lucky to be part of some groups and teams that have done outstanding work. And you know, did I contribute to it? And, you know, to some extent, yes, probably, um, but. Um, well, yes, we did, but to what extent we don't know. But uh, it's 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 an honor, um, to, you know, to be recognized by your peers in the business uh, where there's so much good stuff happening out there. Um, yeah, it 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 it's cool, and yeah, it's a yeah, you know, it's a, it's a great talking piece too when you're at your house. You know, you're like, oh, you have an Emmy, oh yeah, yeah, I did that because you know people are like, oh, you have an Emmy, and they think that's pretty cool, and you can start you know start with your stories. <laughs> Yeah, it it is definitely, again, I'll I'll keep saying it, it's one of those positions in television that very rarely gets noticed. Uh, And then when things do go chaotic, you're the guys that 
to me anyways, being in the TV truck saved everything when things started going bad. Uh, what, what kinds of um, things have happened that you feel like as a team in the operations group that you have been able to kind of salvage when things start to go wrong? Uh, hmm. I, I, too many. Most of the things, <laughs> no, no, and actually that's not it. That, yeah. you know, everyone thinks there's a lot of stuff goes wrong. You know, it very rarely goes wrong, knock on wood. Um, but you can, you know, um, most of it is what I said before. You have resources in other areas that can help you. Uh, if you're, say you lose transmission for whatever reason, you can reroute, sometimes you can reroute a path uh, via fiber path and you have to know who to call. Or if, you know, something blows up, you know, you, you're replacing a piece of equipment or doing without, or, um, you know, some of the, the terrible things that happened to me was in, uh, in uh, Kansas when we were doing the U.S. Open, the, we pulled in and the switcher blew up. Um, and uh, a gentleman named Seth Medway uh, decided to cut the whole thing on a, on a router uh, until we got a small, tiny switcher. So he would router switch something before he'd go to the input to the small, tiny switcher that he had on this gigantic switcher. Uh, and he cut the entire show that way. The people at home didn't know the difference. Um, you know, in the business you might because you might see the limited resources, but you know, those are the things I told you about as utilizing resources, knowing people, and utilizing the ideas that people bring to you. Uh, I think the, 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 the show that I was the closest to ever um, losing was in uh, World Cup soccer in Trinidad and Tobago, and all our stuff got hung up uh, because of the government. Uh, in Trinidad, uh, and um, in customs, and uh, we were supposed to go in there on a Tuesday. It was over after Labor Day weekend, and we couldn't get the stuff out of customs. Um, and despite the help from um, from USA Soccer, ESPN, Le I mean Disney Legal, I mean it was crazy. Um, we ended up finding a, a a broker that put up the bond that we didn't think we had to. Were, we were we were told we didn't need. Uh, by the government, uh, he put up the bond, um, you know, and that wasn't like, a, you know, that wasn't a thousand dollars, that was a large chunk of change. Uh, and we pulled the equipment out. Um, uh, on um, Monday night, we started at eight o'clock. And we worked basically through the night. And uh, we slept for a couple hours, got back at six, and we did the game, um, uh, the, the, the qualifying World Cup uh, match, uh, the next night at seven o'clock from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, but those are the kind of things that, you know, happen very rarely, uh, but they do happen. And again, going back, how do, how do we do that? We knew people, we talked to people. They said, well, this guy might do it. I called him up and he said, I'll do it. I'll, you know, we made some financial arrangements, uh, stuff like that. Um, knowing how to utilize the resources and knowing how to minimize anything from being uh, happening. Uh, the thing that happens, too, that you really have to concentrate on is safety of, of all the people in and around you. Because uh, when people start running around like crazy, when something breaks or something bad happens, worse things can happen. So you have to be the voice of reason and say, "Take a deep breath, everybody. All right, this is you know this is television. Yes, we're we're missing eight minutes of this, but it beats having someone get really hurt or something worse happen by you trying to fix it without thinking it through before you fix it." So those are the kind of the jobs of an ops producer that is is critical when things go wrong is to keep a keep a you know a calm head and not you know stand over somebody who knows something's broken and going you know what is it doing what is it doing <laughs> what are we going to fix it what are we going to fix it what do we you know that's the worst thing you could possibly do you know the guy's trying to fix it he knows it's broken and so let him do his thing so that's kind of it you know is uh, trying to keep the voice of reason um, and keep everyone in, you know calm and and solve it and utilize all the resources resources you have around you to solve it and that usually is the case and depending on the complexity of the event you are working in some pretty rough conditions sometimes i know that some operations producers that i've known have been out in the snow in a tarp or in a tent of some sort they're covered but cold rain you name it what are some of the things you've experienced over the years? Well, I, you hit it on the head. I think ski remotes, skiing, you know, downhill ski remotes are probably the most challenging because it's not like you can walk out to your camera position. 
Um, you have to have plenty of advanced time. You have to have people who are trained to work in the snow, in the cold, um, and to be able to get to their positions. When you're talking like a downhill, you're talking in a very dangerous situation with ice on the, on the piste, and uh, you have to get people in and out safely. You have to make sure that they're warm enough, they have enough food and water and everything else. And then again, as we talked about before, what happens if X, Y, and Z happen? Uh, you have to be prepared in the back of your mind to be able to figure out what you need to do. Um, yeah, some of the, I mean, that heat, weather is usually the, the, the most difficult thing. Like in Australia, if you have, you know, we had, when you were there one year, it was well over triple digits all the time and never got below triple digits. And the heat index was way up. And, you know, you have to you worry about the safety of your folks. You worry about the equipment, you know, melting, blowing up or overheating. Um, the air conditioning never can keep up uh, in temporary situations. Uh, so weather is a big, big factor in, 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 in a big concentration uh, on how, how things go. Um, the other stuff is where you are actually doing a remote and shipping stuff in and out and making sure you have enough lead time and enough time to get stuff out where you're not rushing like a crazy person to try to build something and get it going. You know, some of these set shoot strikes are very challenging from a logistics point of view as well as a technical point of view because you're you're going in doing a very large show, you're pulling in the morning of, you're setting it all up, you're rehearsing it, you're doing the show, and then you're taking it all apart. And those those days last a long time. Again, you have to be really conscious of of the your personnel, the lead time, how you treat the equipment, how you ship the equipment out, how do you make sure that all your folks are, are, you know, doing well and doing the job they need to do and are taken care of. So that is, you know, a little bit of the, of the mother hen aspect of, uh, of operations. One that we, in a, that I guarantee any operations producer, any uh, um, production coordinator, any technical manager that's out there, you know, that's always really high on the, on the list. And all the companies uh, and SVG and people like that are always keep health and safety on the top of your list. And that, as it should be so that's kind of what we do you've worked a lot of events over the years mostly on remote but you also have transitioned into studio building facilities what's the difference there and how were you able to do that um well again um you go in with an you know open eyes and you listen to other people that have the expertise in those areas and you take their advice and you help formulate the, so the solution, right? So um, the, the thing that was different uh, from a studio is a remote, as I mentioned before, is that you, you go to a place and you bring the circus with you and you build a tent and you do the performance and then you take the tent down and everybody goes away with the elephants and away you go and you're on to your next thing. A studio is different in the fact that you have to make everything, if you shoot, if you hit like a 98 or a 95 on a remote, everything goes great and this 3%, 5% that's me and not so well, that's okay because uh, you, you're on to your next thing. You try to avoid that obviously and get 100%, but a lot of times it doesn't happen. If you go into a studio, because shows are day in and day out, they have to be 100% all the time. They can't be, uh, oh yeah, 98% is good enough. Uh, we didn't have that one microphone, or that microphone didn't it was crackling a little bit. That's you know that 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 you know that can't happen. Um, so the difference is, you not only you have um, you have to build in the um, backups to that. You know how to be able to train the crews to be able to switch over to those backups. So you can't make a mistake. So you have to be a little, a lot more fine and, and, and detailed, in my opinion, in a studio environment than you do in a remote environment. That's not to say that a remote environment, you don't want to be, you don't want to be defined and, and, and you know, uncover every, uh, every little thing that possibly could go wrong. But in a studio, it just becomes a little bit more critical because those shows are on regardless every day at 10 o'clock or every day at nine o'clock or whenever that time so you have to you have to be 100 percent in the building of it and the infrastructure of it and then as well as backup solutions again staffing against uh you know what happens if something disaster recovery etc 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 so that's the big difference i think between the studios and remote uh, remote's a little bit a little bit more forgiving uh in the performance side uh, than a studio a studio has to be you know, spot on. And that means every light's got to be perfect and every mark has got to be perfect on the floor and every, 
you know, every microphone, every RF microphone has to, you know, make sure that they don't cross over and they, all that stuff, you know. Um, that's the difference, I think. When you bring on somebody into operations, you, you mentioned uh, production manager, all, all of the positions that are associated with what you do, what do you look for? What are some of the qualities that maybe somebody who's young is and interested in it might might need to consider before getting into this? The keys are our passion for what you're attempting to do uh, and, and the fact that that passion leads to putting in the work involved and the hours that are involved in doing it. Um, that is a key for me. Um, the other key would be to, to be able to be a good communicator and a good, and, and forgive me for saying this, people person. You have to deal with so many different personalities um, and, and um, you have to you know, maintain your, your level and of decorum, your level of, uh, of uh, your attitude um, constantly. You can't go up and down like a, you know, be explosive, go up and down in, 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 a, in, the, day, in the day. Everyone is looking at you and relying on you for, for the guidance and, and the leadership. But I would say, you know, it's passion and personality, I think, would be the two things. You can always learn the job. I did. Um, and people are always, in the television world, it's a small family. And people are all, always willing to teach you if you want to learn. Uh, just keep an open mind, and uh, you have a million people out there that would that lend a hand and 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 guide you if you if you so accepted it. So, you know, I would say that those you know personality and passion are probably the two two things that you you know that you'd want uh, it as a good op operations producer. You can learn the rest. Okay, so a couple more questions, and then I promise okay. I will let you go. Okay. Uh, the first thing is. What memento do you have that is most special to you having worked in, during your career? Or credential? Uh, I, think, I think my the Olympic credentials are the ones I save. Uh, I found a box recently when I was moving of all the credentials and it was really interesting because you could, it was like walking back in time you like pull out this small paper credential of you know Iowa versus Iowa State from Ames, Iowa and you're like and on November twenty fourth, and you know, in a nineteen, you know, ninety six, you're like, what? You know, so it kind of triggers your memory, bringing it back, and the fact that you see this huge box and the volume of actual events that you've been to that you don't remember hardly any of them. I do remember very vividly um, the my role at the World Alpine Ski Championships where I got my start, and also was uh, happened to have been part of a of a group that. Uh, put on a very successful one in 1999. Uh, all the Olympic Games, uh, which are fantastic, and um, I think the World Cup soccer, the the world class state world world stage events, and of course tennis is there. I mean, I could go on, but I don't really carry mementos per se. Um, I do keep some credentials here and there, um, just because they're kind of fun for a year. But um, it's all in, it's all memories. I think is the best part about it. You know, thinking back on all those times to and all the people that you've met through the process. It's, that's that's my memento, I, I guess. Terry Brady, former director of ESPN Remote Operations, now consultant. Uh, what's next for you here? Uh, golf, I think, uh, as soon as it gets warm again. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I'm trying to figure out what I do when I grow up. So uh, <laughs> when, I, when I figure it out, I'll let you know, Don. Well, next time you get to Denver, we'll have to go golfing. Absolutely. Sounds right. good. And that could be in February, too. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah, Denver it could weather. be any time, really, as long as it's warm. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. All right, Terry, thank you so much for joining me. It's great catching up with you, and, and I look forward to seeing what you've got coming up in the future. Great. Thanks, Don. Appreciate it. It was great fun. Be well. Thanks to my good friend Terry Brady for explaining what the operations teams do and for sharing some of his stories. Even though he's recently retired from ESPN, he's still going to be making an impact on many sports around the world. Again, this episode has visuals, so visit at Sportsmaking on YouTube to see what it was we talked about. If you like this episode, be sure to subscribe to at Sportsmaking on YouTube or your preferred podcast listening platform. More great episodes are on their way, and if there is someone that works in sports that you'd like to hear from, drop a comment on YouTube or on the Facebook page. Also, like, share, and review. Thank you for listening to Sports in the Making. I'm your host, Don Cardona. <laughs>